Hello, and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Neurobehavioral Consultants. Are your underpaid and overworked employees not productive, productive enough? Are you relying on conditioning schedules that they figured out and that you always use variable ratio? Well, spruce up your 20th century behavioral methods with some 21st century neuroscience. Uh, pay your employees, or let's say that again, play your employees' nucleus accumbens like Mozart with our scientifically validated work incentives and motivation techniques. We're not going to give you any mumbo jumbo consultant speak like you'll get from other firms. No, we're going to give you arcane scientific jargon that will only be loosely related to any of the high level cognitive processes that we'll say will be changing. Our understanding of neuroscience will help companies understand the emotional and subconscious aspects of decision making and formulate strategies to improve productivity and subjective well being. Mention the Keyword engage brain to receive a discount on our dopamine, our initial meet and greet package. In emotion and memory episode, we learned about the boost and consolidation and recall that emotion can give to memories. But what happens when the process goes awry and the emotional boost becomes a runaway? A positive feedback loop of a negative memory, an emotional state, and the physical arousal. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is a common mental health condition triggered by experiencing or seeing a terrifying event, and it affects over 3 million people every year. PTSD so far has no cure and can last many months or even years, uh, with triggers bringing back a memory to the present along with those intense emotional and physical experiences that accompanied the original experience. Today I speak with Madison Scarrett about PTSD and the brain. <laughs> I just like to keep getting them uh, wrong on, uh, on the recording. Uh, so thank you for coming in. I'm with Madison Scarrett, and we're talking about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and the brain. Um, and I thought we'd first start um, by asking uh, if you could tell me how you were interested in in the topic? Um, So I myself have PTSD um, and so I never really understood how exactly it worked in in terms of the mechanisms and how I guess different things like triggers and memory and why certain memories were I guess coded a different way than other memories and so I just was really interested in just discovering more about it and I thought this project was a great way of doing that. Yeah, and, and what have you found so far that's been really interesting? Um, well, I guess for me personally, a lot of the things that I found interesting are things that paralleled my own experiment experience with PTSD. For example, I was reading a couple of different, uh, I guess, research sorry, papers, and mm-hmm. in the papers I found uh, the idea of certain people with PTSD like see their experiences from um, an external point of view, yeah. and that was one of the coping mechanisms for that. And mm-hmm. so, um, and I realized that paralleled my own experience of PTSD, and so I thought that was really interesting because I was able to grow myself um, just by doing this research project. But also, I found that the idea that there are verbally accessible memories and situationally accessible memories and that those were particularly relevant to PTSD and just the idea of that your feelings and your mood are very important for how you encode the memory and so the idea that you can't really put the memory itself into context it's usually like very it's detail oriented but it's usually very I guess jumpy is something that would be considered, I guess, a situationally accessible memory, and that's common for everyone with PTSD, which I thought was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, how about in terms of uh, the public's understanding of PTSD? I feel like it's it's kind of out there for like um, generally in um, like a, maybe a war context, uh, so yeah. like soldiers returning from war. Um, but I think uh, a lot of people don't really understand uh, what PTSD is, so is there some aspects of uh, PTSD that are confusing to the public? I think 
PTSD in general is very confusing to the public because I usually I hear a lot of people mention PTSD and say oh maybe I'll have PTSD from this memory as like a joke without a true understanding of what PTSD really is and many people do associate it with war Mm -hmm. but that the people women get PTSD more than anyone else Mm -hmm. or more than men and a lot of it isn't from war it's from other experiences that Mm -hmm. they have and so um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about PTSD and I guess exactly how that affects people because I have heard like a lot of people who joke about PTSD but don't really understand the consequences that it does have for the individual yeah. and their families and like, how exactly that works. So I thought that this project, especially how I laid it out, was very helpful because it explains what is PTSD, Mm -hmm. what are the symptoms, what are the consequences, how it works in terms of your memory, what are triggers, and then what are treatments. So it really just lays out exactly how PTSD works to people who wouldn't normally research PTSD or think about that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the project that you just mentioned was uh, PTSD Triggers and Treatments uh, from the community page on BuzzFeed. And I'm wondering, uh, after posting that, did you have any sort of response from family or friends uh, reading through it? I actually got a lot of responses from people who were just happy to learn um, the information. They thought that it was a very easy read and that just reading it made them understand the disorder more so. And so I got a lot of positive feedback. Yeah. And then other people who, um, especially because it was around, I think it was the week after mental health. Yeah, Mar- it was posted March 4th. Yeah, and so people were really excited about that people were talking about mental health at all. Okay. So yeah. that it was contributing to that was um, actually a very positive experience for some. Mm-hmm. So. And have you been able to see any like viewer characteristics uh, if you log into? Um, I haven't been able to see the viewer characteristics, but I do, for the most part, a lot of the people that have read it have been people on Facebook that I've like, mm-hmm. posted the link for oh, okay. or like my mom's friends okay, yeah. <laughs> co-workers because I was just like mom just push it out there yeah, yeah. <laughs> just get people to read it and learn about cognitive neuroscience yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's great um, and so going uh, forward do you think that there's any new or exciting areas of, of research with into PTSD in particular maybe treatments um I think they're still trying to figure out what treatments truly work for different individuals just mm-hmm. because there are so many different types of treatments and everyone's I guess reactions and symptoms of PTSD are slightly different and so I saw that some people use family therapy even though Mm -hmm. family therapy would not at all help others and then there's other types of therapies that are just being understood which are like you intervene for yourself Mm -hmm. within the experience which is something that I never even thought about Um, and so they're really just trying to figure out what therapies besides exposure therapy works because exposure therapy can take a lot of time and it can be really detrimental to the person during the therapy yeah um but also i guess they're also trying to figure out why specifically it's just um negative memories because Mm -hmm. sometimes you can have positive memories that can cause stress but more positive stress and yeah we don't code the information the same way and have the same sort of like trigger for happy memories. It's only negative memories. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that's being studied. You know? Yeah, that's really interesting. I haven't thought of like intrusive, overly intrusive, positive yeah. memories. Uh, I get, I, maybe the closest I could think of would be like an addiction, uh, would be like a. Yeah. Um, or even if maybe you smelled like pie or something that yeah. reminded you of. Thanksgiving or something, but it's still not the same kind of disordered memory that is tied to PTSD. And so yeah. I wonder how that's coded differently mm-hmm. than, I guess, the negative memories. Yeah, and I feel like those positive memories just don't have the same like physiological responses. Like, um, like I feel like negative ones are just like such bodily, like visceral things, whereas positive memories, it's kind of like a warmth. But yeah. that's, that's pretty general. I mean, some things I feel like can cause a lot of external reactions. Like if you mm-hmm let's say I guess someone comes home after like a couple of years that can still cause you to your heartbeat to raise and stress in like the form of like sweating and other things that I feel like would maybe would code that differently in Mm -hmm. some sort of way because you are having some sort of physiological response um 
but they haven't found, or right now they haven't found any like research information that really gives us a, I guess, a look into that mm -hmm. kind of idea. Yeah, and so kind of getting ready to wrap up, do you think there's any one really important thing that you th think the public should know about PTSD? Um, I guess myself, I feel that trigger warnings are really important, mm -hmm. even though there are a lot of debates about them now because it's considered to be um, like sheltering people from uh, like the true emotion they may feel from whatever they're about to be shown, but in reality for the people who do have the experiences of PTSD, it's really, really helpful because having, let's say, one trigger can cause them to have, I guess, an awful day for the rest of the day where they can't focus, especially in schools where you're supposed to be at your best in order yeah. to exceed and, or succeed and excel. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. All right, uh, so then as we wrap up, uh, can you think of anything you'd like to promote? Um, I would like to promote my mom's farmer's market at Down to Earth. Um, it's in Colts ne Neck, New Jersey, and it's this really adorable farmer's market and this little shop, and um, they have organic vegetables and fruits. They have nuts and honeys and jams and meats and cheeses, and it's really cool. Um, and I would also like to promote the Mixed Identities Alliance um, event April 15th. Um, it's going to be a karaoke night from 8 to 10, and it's going to be in Love Basement, it's going to be really cool, so I'll show up for that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for stopping by, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, to Madison for coming in and uh, sharing her experience and uh, her thoughts on, on PTSD in the brain. Uh, to wrap up the show with just two, uh, three more segments. Uh, first, I'll turn to uh, Jake's Jams, things that I've been uh, interested in lately. Uh, and one that I'm sad to see go uh, that is uh, going to not exist any longer is Copy. Uh, it was a cloud storage option similar to Dropbox uh, that I'd been using uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, but I find uh, a reminder a couple times a day now uh, that uh, copy will be no more. So I'm currently looking for robust uh, cloud, cloud storage options outside of Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox is something that I do use, but I, I like to kind of have multiple options. Uh, so if anyone is interested uh, or has a suggestion, uh, please uh, let me know. Uh, you can contact me at EngageBrain on Twitter or uh, through email at my last name at gmail.com. Uh, so turning to uh, the second to last segment, uh, the, a new one uh, to the show, uh, Scholar Notifications. Uh, last time uh, I talked about uh, Amy Belfi's work in uh, memory, and emo um, sorry, memory, emotion, uh, music. Uh, here on PTSD, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to another uh, friend and collaborator, Daniela Palumbo, who's currently a postdoc at uh, Boston University. And uh, her work that was incredibly interesting, uh, published last year, um, McKinnon and Palumbo, 2015, in Clinical uh, Psychological Science, uh, A Threat of Death and Autobiographical Memory, A Study of Passengers from Flight AET-236. Uh, so this was a group of individuals who were flying uh, from Canada to Europe, and um, late in the flight uh, they uh, experienced trouble, and the pilot had to uh, crash land in, in some uh, islands off of the uh, coast of Portugal. And so for about 20 or 30 minutes, the passengers uh, thought that uh, they were uh, going to die. And one of the passengers on that flight uh, was uh, co-first author, uh, Margaret McKinnon. And uh, after uh, that experience, they investigated the autobiographical memory in this group of passengers on board the transatlantic flight uh, that nearly had to ditch at sea. Uh, and so they looked at uh, the traumatic exposure across those passengers, some of whom developed PTSD uh, and some who didn't. Uh, because it provided a unique opportunity to assess verified memory for life-threatening trauma. Uh, so using the autobiographical interview, uh, which was developed by my postdoctoral, uh, one of my postdoctoral advisors, Brian Levine, and uh, Daniela's uh, graduate advisor, uh, which separates episodic from non-episodic details, uh, so like I described in uh, the episode on uh, music in the brain uh, with Heather Robinson. Passengers and healthy controls are called three events. Uh, the airline disaster uh, and September 11th, so interestingly, the airline disaster occurred about a month before September 11th, 2001. 
and a non-emotional event. Uh, all the passengers showed a robust enhancement for episodic details uh, relative to the airline disaster, uh, although neither richness nor accuracy of the traumatic recollection was related to PTSD. Uh, but uh, the production of non-episodic details for traumatic and non-traumatic events was elevated in PTSD passengers, uh, and that uh, was really interesting because it indicated a robust mnemonic enhancement for trauma that is not specific to PTSD. Rather, it seems that PTSD is associated with altered cognitive control operations that affect autobiographical memory in general. And so that was uh, the paper, Threat of Death and Autobiographical Memory, a study of passengers from Flight AT-236, uh, with co-first authors uh, McKinnon and Palumbo, uh, published in 2015. Uh, a really interesting paper on PTSD and, and something that uh, I'm hoping to continue collaborating on um, with that work. Uh, so then wrapping up the show, turning to uh, reader mail, mailbag, uh, Twitter tweets, uh, nothing so far, uh, but uh, as I put a call out earlier in the show, uh, I'm interested in looking for uh, suggestions for cloud storage options, uh, in particular free ones, but uh, maybe I'll take the dive and start paying for uh, some cloud options. Uh, but uh, while I like Dropbox, uh, I'd like to explore uh, other potential options. Uh, so y- you can reach me at EngageBrain on Twitter or uh, email me at my last name at gmail.com. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll talk later. Thank you.